And also, I want to mention this. We mentioned this some weeks ago. If you're in need of a Bible, please let our church know. If you're in a situation where you can't uh, afford one for yourself or you're not able to find one uh, easily, please let our church know. We would be uh, delighted and honored to present a Bible to you so you can study God's Word uh, through the week. Uh, so hopefully you're in Luke 24. As we sang so many of these songs today, and as, as uh, Pete just prayed about, he triumphantly rose out of the grave. As we look at this uh, ch- uh, verses today, Luke 24, verses 13 and following, I just want to say a quick prayer. I, hopefully we all know that where two or three are gathered together, there is Christ in our midst. But I just want to thank the Lord for being here with us. You know, we don't, I, I know sometimes I don't always really stop to appreciate that Jesus is right here with us. He, he, it's not, he's not, yes, he's off in heaven and preparing a place for us, but as we gather together and as we discuss these holy things of the Lord, these biblical truths, Jesus, respectfully, I'll say, he stops what he's doing and he says, I want to be with you in that tight knit, special, unique, loving time as you're speaking the words and thinking on the words of God. So I'd just like to thank the Lord for being with us. Would you just bow with me as we open in prayer for our service? Father, we do thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus Christ, into this world. And as we've sang today, as the praise team, praise band is mentioned, and then Brother Pete just in his prayer that you went to the cross, you died, you were buried, you rose again, and triumphantly conquered the grave. Father, what a blessing it is that you send your son to us right now as we're gathered together studying these important holy words of, of, that you've given to us, that you've revealed to us so unworthily. But even though we're unworthy, you've made us worthy through the blood of Christ. And in that same worthiness, then you not only made us worthy to go to heaven, but you gave us your wisdom and your words and your, uh, how we should live our lives as Christians once we take that role and accept the free gift of salvation from you. Father, help us to work out our salvation through sanctification and holiness and, and being aware at all times that Jesus is right here in our presence. And he gives his peace to us if we will simply obey your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And Luke, uh, we're going to pick up in Luke 24, verse 13, as I mentioned a moment ago. I just want to jump up in verse 9 real quick. Uh, this is where we went last week with Easter. Verse 9 says, when they came back from the tomb, and these were, uh, and I want to do this because our, our passage today makes several mentions of these things, these words, these things, they, them. And without knowing who them, they, all these things are today, uh, the pronouns, I want to pick up a little bit to say, kind of refresh us who's there. And so verse 9 says, when they came back, and these are the women that went to the tomb, they told all things to the 11 and to the others. There was a, the 11 disciples were there, the 11 apostles, and there were other people gathered together at, uh, on Sunday, the day that Jesus rose from the grave. Remember, the women went there, uh, so the Mary, the other Mary, there's different ones mentioned there. Some of the women went there. Mary Magdalene, they came back and they told me, they said, we went to the tomb and, and there was a man in shining white, these two angels, and they had rolled the stone away. And we went in and we saw the tomb was empty and, and Christ is not there. And they asked us, why are you looking for the, the living among the dead? And, and they relayed all these words that were spoken directly from the throne of God through these angels to these women. And they told the 11 and the apostles that were there, they told them these words, uh, Mary, the mother of James was there and the others with them who told us to the apostles. Look at verse 11. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. They walked and spoke physically with Jesus, telling him these words. And when they had another human being give confirmation of these words, they didn't believe him. I, I, I so breaks my heart, and I'm sure it does yours too, when you witness and you share with someone. And I, I talked to somebody this week, I said, is... is uh, the Lord working on them, and they said, I don't think so. And I said, well, have you shared the gospel with them? And they said, yes, it's a, I'm not going to go into too many details here. It's a woman that's an atheist. She's passing. She's got a seven-year-old daughter. She has no family. Her fear is what to do with her, her daughter in this situation. And of course, the friend said, I'm worried about my friend's salvation as well as her daughter. But she said, she is absolutely, completely rejected. She doesn't believe at all the scriptures. I, I guess I tell you that to say, let's pray for her as a church Obviously, we're not going to, I can't give her name, or details much more than that, but uh, that's, a, that's a harrowing position to be in, that if you don't believe in God and you're, you've got a cancer, that you're going to die soon, you've got a seven-year-old child, you've got no family, you have no idea what's going to happen to your child in the future, and, and so often you hear me say, I don't see how people go through this world without Christ, because with Christ it's hard. 
with the Lord, it's difficult. There's heartache, there's pains, there's struggles, there's family relationships that are stressed and strained and broken sometimes. And, and there's and there's and there's and there's and there's and there's. And we have Christ. And it hurts. I really can't imagine someone that says, I reject it and I live this without any power, without any belief in a supreme being. I don't believe that I'm worthy of God because there is no God. I don't see how they go through this world. And so here when it says they did not believe them, there's people today that don't believe. They just don't believe it. They, they understand the words. They understand when I say Jesus died and was buried and rose. I understand what you believe, but I don't believe it. And we're, and we're going to talk about this more as we get down into our main passage today. Uh, so verse 11, they did not believe. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb and bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and he went away. And now here Peter walked with Christ for three years. He was one of the inner circle. Peter, James, and John, they were, went up to the Mount of Transfiguration. When he raised the dead girl, he brought them in with him, just those three. He has seen, he has seen it all. He has heard it all. And he walks away saying, well, that's weird. Linen was laying there. I heard Jesus say he was going to rise again, but empty tomb and empty grave clothes. I don't know what, that make, I don't know what to make of that. It, it, I just don't understand how people can look at such truth and, and just reject it. And, and I'm not throwing rocks at Peter, obviously I'm not, because we all do the same thing, don't we? The Lord's clear and tells us what to do. We know what we're supposed to do. We know the good deeds we're supposed to be doing is uh, Gideon today in Bible study in uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We love those verses. By grace are we saved through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. And they said, but we don't like verse 10 because you were created to do good works. Well, I like the part where me and Jesus are hanging out together and talking and visiting and that sweet hour of prayer, but when it gets up to going doing something, eh, not so much. I want to stay here in this nice, tight, comfortable place with my Lord. And, and I get that. I really do. When it's pouring rain and 35 degrees or whatever it was a few weeks of freezing, you look out there, no, not today. I'm not going out there. Well, that's the world we live in as ambassador of Christ. We go into a cold, cruel world daily. I think Brother Rick a few weeks ago said, I love that sign when you leave. And many of you have mentioned it. You know, you are now entering the mission field. You're leaving the basic training area, and you're entering the mission field. Now is where you do the work. And Jesus himself said, you know, the flesh is, uh, the spirit is willing. You know, sign me up. I'll volunteer. I work in Awanas. I'll be a Sunday school teacher. I'll do all these things. Okay, now it's time to show up. Well, something came up. I can't quite do that next step. And so our passage today is going to lean towards that. And uh, verse 11, it says, now the same day. Now the same day, that's why I said it's got a lot of I'll call them pronouns, not necessarily the same day, but it's got to go back to the same day as that Sunday. The Sunday that all this stuff was said and done, on that Sunday morning, two of them, the them is the 11 and or those that were with them. Remember it said they went back to the 11 and the others that were with them, and they said these things. So the them in verse 13 is now that same day Sunday, two of them that were with them and heard the Marys come and speak about all that they saw. They were going to a village called Emmaus. So it was about seven miles, or your translation might say six stadia from Jerusalem. About a seven-mile walk. When's the last time you walked seven miles? Just, just walked. It's got a little different day, but I would encourage you, walk seven miles one day and, and think about the, their walking home, and that was just a natural order of business for them, but they were, uh, they were talking to each other. I found it really interesting as I was studying this. They were talking with each other. That word there, normally I was thinking it would be lelago. It, they were speaking together, talking together, but the word is homilago. It's where we get a word homily. It is only used four times in the entire New Testament, this word. It says, as they were talking together, as they were speaking holy things of the Lord. And it also has this idea of uh, commonness or being together. You know, you could speak about the weather or uh, trucks. And I might say, well, Chevy's the best. And uh, if Ross was here, you might say, no, Ford's the best. Or Chris says Ford's the best. And someone said, what are y'all talking about? We're talking about trucks. So we're talking about the same thing, but there's not a meeting of the mind. You know, there's a difference. We're speaking the same thing, but there's not agreement. This word here, talking, it says they were talking. It means they were speaking of the same things, and they were in agreement mentally. They were together, not just in their words, but in their minds, in their thoughts. And then I was thinking about that this week, saying, how sweet is it that as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, the blood that holds us together, we may disagree about everything out there. When we come together and talk about the holy things of the Lord, we're in agreement. You might, you might all agree with me that the Chicago Bears are the best football team that the world's ever seen. 
Some of you may, <laughs> Gideon, <laughs> it's the blood of Christ <laughs> that holds us together. Gideon just left. But all these things that we discuss or talk about, and we say, well, we disagree. We're talking about the same thing, but we have no agreement in that area. But when we come to Christ, as they were talking together, as they had the same thoughts, the same mental agreement, and it is so hard to find that. You've heard me say before, sometimes on Wednesdays, uh, I might be here by myself, and the lights are off, and I like to come down here and pray. And, and I'll be in the building by myself, and sometimes I get into arguments with myself. Maybe you've been there. You start ar- and I'm like, who am I arguing with? I'm by myself, and I'm arguing. Well, here it says they were talking together. We've got, uh, thank you, uh, David counted about 76 people here today. There's 76 of us, and as we study these words, as we sing these songs, as we lift up holy hands, we're in agreement. Some of us don't even know one another. But when it comes to the things of the Lord, that blood, that binding, that Christ, that sacrifice he's made for us, it holds us together. We can be in agreement on this. And there is no power on this earth that's going to come against the, the, the church. We are st- stuck together, hold, held together by the blood of Christ, and we can come together and we can be, uh, this word here, uh, hamilego, the same words meaning a, a meeting of the minds. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked, this is that same word again. Remember I said it was used four times in the New Testament, this word? Twice it's used right here. As they talked together, verse, verse 14, verse 15, as they talked they, and discussed these things with each other. So it's really as they had the same mind of the same things and they began speaking with one another about these things. They discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. How sweet is that, the promise, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I also. They were gathered in the unity of Christ, not understanding everything, and that's kind of where we are. No no person that's ever walked this earth except, save Jesus Christ, will understand the full mind of God. You're you're going to reveal some stuff to to Lori, and they're going to reveal some stuff to Rachel, and reveal some stuff to Jill, and God's going to reveal certain things. We come together, and we talk, and we work through, and we, well, God, I've got this piece of God's kind of mind. He's given me a little bit, and you've got this, and do they fit together? Do we kind of get a fuller understanding of who the Lord is? And as we work towards that iron sharpening iron situation, Jesus says, I'm going to be right there in the midst leading you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be encouraging you, cheering you on to understand more. Does God want us to understand this book? Clearly he does. But our limited minds, our sinful, stupid, sin, limited minds just, I, I so often pray, God, I, I, what are you saying? I, I see the words. I can read the words. I mentally understand the words that are said, the sentence structure, but what are you telling me? And I want you to understand when God says something, he's telling it to you. There's a divine command in his words. He expects things to happen. When God said, let there be light, did the light obey? When God said, let the earth bring forth, did the earth obey? When God says, believe in my son, do we obey? When God says, obey me, when God says, thou shalt have no other gods, we're the ones that don't obey. And we know the words, and we willfully sin. It says, so, but Jesus is there with us. And I'm hoping this, that as we think about these things, that we're studying the word, we start thinking, Jesus is not off away. He's right here with me. And should that affect and change my behavior? And I'm going to tell you it should. He's right there with you. So it said they stood down, as he came to them, he said, what are you discussing together as you walk? So here Jesus challenged them. Do you think Jesus knew what they, this is his resurrected body. Do you think Jesus knows what they were talking about? Absolutely. This is one of those questions I was going to do a series a couple years ago, the questions of Jesus. And so often he asks questions like the, the guy with the hand, do you want to be healthy? Do you want to be healed? You know, do you want your daughter to rise up? Do you want this? Do you, you know, what do you want? What do you ask of me? Jesus has all these questions. What he's doing is uh, pressing us to, to rise up to that next level of understanding. So he tells them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Depending on your translation, mine says they stood there with their faces down. Some of yours says he asked them, what are you discussing together as they were sad? This word is their faces were uh, downcast. It is a, a sorrow and a mourning. And, and I can almost see them. And they answer, uh, one of them named Cleopas, which is the uh, masculine of the verb, uh, the, the name Cleopatra. Cleopas just real quick, if you, you can do this a separate study if you want to jot this down. There's very good information biblically. This was the uncle of Jesus. This was Mary's brother. Uh, you can study that at your leisure at some other point, but uh, he would have been one of the people of the 11 that were in that room as they were gathered together. It says two of them left. There's very 
strong evidence in uh, John 19, 25 also, I think if you read that, it'll certainly lend you to believe this might be the uncle of Jesus Christ, the brother of Mary, his mother. Uh, anyway, uh, one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? So he's thinking the whole Roman Empire has been turned upside down. The whole city of Jerusalem, the whole nation of Israel has been turned upside down these last three days, these three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday with Passover, and then that Jesus was put in the grave and he was crucified, he was handed over. How do you not know who he is? How do you not know this? They're asking him almost incredulously, how, what, what do you mean you don't know what's going on? I had someone ask me this week, they said, what year is it again? And I was like, you've been locked up too long or something. But it's kind of that, how do you not know what year it is? I've done that. I wrote a check a few weeks ago, put 19. I thought, 19? Oh. <laughs> We're not even the 19s anymore. I don't even know what century it is. You know. So it happens. But anyway, so they're asking the Jesus, they, say, they don't know he's Jesus, but they say, how do you not know what's happening? Jesus challenged them again. Second question, what things? What things are you talking about? He's trying, I, I believe he is trying to grow their discussion. You know, they've been talking about it, and Jesus shows up and says, what are you talking about? Why are you sad? Well, don't you know what's happened about these things, the things, and the things are there back in verse uh, 8 and 9 in there. It says they came back from the tomb. They told them uh, the tomb was empty. The grave cloths were separate. The things that the women told them, these are these things. I point that out because these things in this passage shows up about four or five times. And I want us to be clear on what are these things. These things are the things that Jesus was handed over the hands of sinful men. He was crucified. He died. He was put in a, a grave. The grave was opened. The clothes were left empty. He'll never need grave clothes again. And he rose out of the tomb victoriously, and he's coming back. Amen. Those are the these things. And so, and we see that over and over this passage, it brings our minds today, 2,000 years later, what are these things? We start, as the, as the story pulls us in, as the narrative pulls us in, we start saying, what are, what are you talking about, these things? What are you, dis verse 17, what are you discussing together as you walk? Verse 19, what things are you talking about? Asked Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, Jesus was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And uh, it's interesting here, they didn't list him as Lord. Today in Bible study, if you were there, I would encourage you, if you're not in Bible study, to start attending. We've got some great teachers and discussions in there, and it's a good time of fellowship. Uh, but uh, today we're looking at, uh, I think, Luke 19, and we talked about, I think it was Bartimaeus. They didn't mention in there in that passage, said the blind beggar. And then uh, it was Zacchaeus, both Bartimaeus, who cried out, Lord, son of David, Jesus, called him Lord. And then Zacchaeus said, Lord, here are these inner circles, the, the 11 and the others that were there, that close group. They call him Jesus of Nazareth. They don't say Jesus, Lord. They don't say the Lord Jesus. They don't acknowledge him as Lord yet. Folks, we might believers in who Jesus is. Have you found a place? Yes, you're saved. Yes, you're going to heaven. Do you understand the, the complete understanding when it says, Lord Jesus. Lord means you are in control. I am not. My, my behavior, my actions, my words will be based on what you tell me to say and do. We fail. We fail miserably. But our mindset needs to be, you are Lord. I am not. I told you that bumper sticker years ago my grandmother had that said, Jesus is my co-pilot. And as I, I guess as a kid, I kind of liked it. As I got older, I said, well, you're in the wrong seat. Jesus is not the co-pilot. Jesus is the pilot. He's the, he's the one that runs the show. Not Well, he's my co-pilot. He's in the car next to me. I'm driving. I'm doing the gas and the brakes and the, where we're going. And he's there telling me stuff. You're in the wrong seat. You are in the wrong seat without question. Jesus is the pilot of, of our lives. So he says, what things uh, are you discussing? And they answered, oh, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, so they acknowledged he was a prophet. See, their theology and their understanding, they did have some understanding. He, he's from Nazareth. He's a prophet. He spoke God's words. We saw that a few weeks ago in Hebrews that Jesus was, in fact, a prophet. He spoke for God, and that's what a prophet does. He spoke for God. He's a, he was powerful in word. and Man, he had dead people come back to life. He walked on water. He changed water into wine. He had blind people see. He, had, he was powerful in word when he spoke. People were stunned at his wisdom. He was 12 years old in the temple, and the... Pharisees and Sadducees came and spoke to him and the teachers of the law, and he dumbfounded them when he was 12. He spoke so incredible with wisdom, and his deeds, his works were unbelievable. Nicodemus even said, we know you're from God because nobody, nobody does the things you do lest God be with them. The power you're, 
you're showing this world is unquestionably from the throne of God. So their, their theology is not too far off. He's a prophet, spoke for God. He was powerful in his words, his speak. He did great deeds before all the people. Everyone saw what he did. The whole city was a buzz of what he did. Uh, and he did all these things to the chief priests and our rulers. They handed him over to be sentenced to death there. He, uh, verse 20, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. So they, they said who Jesus was before crucifixion. They had a pretty good handle. They had at the crucifixion, the Easter season, the Passover season, our chief rulers handed him over to be sentenced of death, and they crucified him. And then I got to verse 21. I thought the same thing. And they said, but we had hoped... Your translation might say we were hoping that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And I st started looking at that. That had hoped is a past tense. And if you're in a situation where you are in life today where you have kind of lost hope a little bit, you look at what's going on and you're like, I've just, we, I had hoped that 2021 was going to be better than 2020. I had hoped my health was going to be better. I had hoped that this was going to get fixed somehow. I, I had hoped. I want you to realize with Christ there's always hope. Hope is not a past tense for believers. We have a living hope. Amen. Our hope should never, it, it may get assaulted and pressured and tested, but we should never be in the position that I had hoped that we have a living hope. Our hope is ongoing. We, we, we're, I'm, I'm, not only, I'm not hoping in the sense of it may happen, I'm going to heaven. I'm hoping, I'm waiting for it to happen. I know it's going to happen. It will happen if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. We don't have to have had hope or feel hopeless, with Christ you always have hope. There's always hope with Christ. No matter what's going on, family, kids, health, the list is endless. Those are seems to be some of the big ones. Finances, those are seem to be some big ones there. There's always hope in Christ. In Christ there's always hope. So they said to him, well, we had hoped he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. Because Now here's where their theology kind of goes astray. They said who he was, prophet, he's from Nazareth, he's mighty in works and deeds, and the chief priest handed him over to be crucified, and he was crucified, and, and we, our king was going to be a victorious king that came in on a white horse, a stallion with 10,000 soldiers, they were going to overthrow us, Rome, and we were going to be a free nation again, and, and, and we had hoped he was going to be the one that was going to lead us out into, into victory over Rome. I am so glad, looking back at this, that God didn't say, Israel, I'm going to release you from Rome. I'm so glad he said, world, I'm going to release you from death and the grave and sin. His goal, God's goal, was not to necessarily let Israel free of Rome. It was to loosen the world from sin in the grave. His plan was here. Their plan was here. And I think about this so often in my own mind. Where are we? I was thinking today, you heard me say a moment ago, as churches across America meet, we are one part of a giant worldwide body. This membership, Autumn Creek, there's a worldwide church of true believers of Jesus Christ that are meeting today and going over spiritual, holy words. We're in homilego. We're in the same mind as people on the other side of the world don't even speak our language or we don't speak their language. But in Christ, we're united. And we don't have to have, we had hoped for this little bitty thing. I'm looking for the day when we send out pastors from this church and some of these kids up here, I, uh, several months ago, I got on my heart to start praying for them. And as a matter of fact, I was even looking at Dave there and Chris and Matt, some of the younger men in our church here, and I was back there singing. I'm thinking, these are the men in 20, 30 years that will be leading the, this generation here in 30 or 40 years. God has that generation after generation after generation rise up and speak these things to the world. And as we're starting to get older and slowing down some and, and maybe losing some abilities, God has a whole host of people coming up right through this church. I used to go to church years ago, uh, Mims Baptist up in Conroe, and the pastor there said his, the Lord laid on him to raise up p pastors. G Galen Cooper of Oak Ridge Baptist, probably about 15 men that were in that church back in our 20s that are all pastors today. God said, it's laid on my heart to raise up pastors for the future generation. He's gone now. Brother Gene Kendrick's gone on but he's made an impact on my life. He said, you're going to be a pastor, trust me. Man, I'm not going to be a pastor. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> Some of you may agree with him. <laughs> but in any event, uh, so they said, but their hope was, their, they had such a narrow hope of what God was going to do. His vision was out here. He had a worldwide vision. They had an Israel vision, very small vision. His vision was so much bigger. 
And it said, and then we don't know exactly, but either way, their countenance was fallen. They were sorrowful. He said, we had, ho- he, we had hoped he would be the one that was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is now the third day. Now, this is either after three days, they said once someone's dead for three days, they are, in fact, dead. We would say they're dead when, you know, they're dead. But they had this, you wait three days, so they might be not quite dead yet. So either that, or maybe they did kind of remember their words, and they said, he said he's going to raise up on the third day, and this is the third day. And it's now late in the day. We're going to see in a moment, it says now late in the day. We've been waiting for him to come back, or we've been waiting for him to redeem, and now he's dead. He's in the ground. We don't know where he is. We don't know what's going on. Do you feel like that with Jesus sometimes? Lord, I'm just holding on. I don't know what you're doing, how you're doing it, what's going on. I'm just holding on for dear life that you know what you're doing because I could not make it without knowing you're behind the driver wheel. You know, I am just upside down in this world, not knowing what's happening. But, but thank you, God, for you are in com- control and you do know what's going on. And uh, G- that's what the Lord wants, just to come to him as little children. Trust in him. Put your faith in me. That's what God tells us. Put your faith in me. I, I've got it under control. But God, you don't have it under control. I have to do something for it to be under control. I have to be in charge of this. I have to get my view and my points. And God, I, I know you're there, but you're not really in control. I got to be in control. That's in us. Don't eat the apple. But God, I got to be in control. I have to. And so that's kind of what they're here. They're saying it's been three days now and he's... He, He's either really dead or he lied or he's not back and we don't know what's going on. And in addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels and said he was alive. Verse 24, then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they didn't see Jesus either. And we don't know what God's doing. And because we don't know, we're sad and we're sorrowful. We don't know what to think of this. And we're wondering what's happening. And Jesus said to them, boy, don't you wish, well, that's okay. Just keep plugging along. You're doing fine. Is that what he says in verse 25? He said to them, you fools, how foolish are you? And how slow to believe. You know, Jesus is standing with him saying, "I, I spoke to you, Uncle Cleopas. You know what I told you. You know what God's goal was. I was clear with that. Do you think Jesus came down here, was cryptic, and didn't, his disciples didn't know what he meant? Or, and his goal was, I'm going to try to trick those people. I'm going to be real cryptic and not, not try to explain things clearly. I think quite the opposite. I, I, whenever I study the Bible, pardon me, Lord, forgive me for my brain. I know for a fact the passage I'm reading and studying you want me to understand, but I don't understand. But the fault is not in your revelation. The fault's in my brain. Our, my brain does not work like God designed it. None of our brains do. Could you imagine naming every single animal and remembering every single animal's name? When God told Adam, name all the animals, and he, protozoas and amoebas and elephants and giraffes, and just, yeah, I got them all down right here. I, you know, a moment ago, I forget what, I go in a room and forgot what I walked in there for. You know, I came in here for something. Yeah, you know, Kelly, send me a text when I go to the kitchen to get a cold drink or something. I want to go out there, I'll forget by the time I get out there. So she'll send me a text, get a cold drink. I'll go to the kitchen, what is, oh, yeah, cold, oh yeah, that's right, cold drink. <laughs> we, our brains don't work right. We forget stuff. And we forget, unfortunately, we forget the holy words of God so often. God will tell us something, and five minutes later, we're doing our thing. I know I'm supposed to do that, but I'm busy over here right now. I'm doing my thing. So Jesus said, how foolish are you and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to offer these, uh, did not have to suffer these things, again, we see that word, these things. He says, did not Messiah have to suffer these things? So Jesus is now revealing to them who Jesus was. They said back here, Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet, mighty in deed, mighty in work. Jesus is now raising their theology. The person we're speaking of, didn't he have to suffer? Didn't Messiah have to suffer these things uh, and then enter his glory? The suffering was first. He said, you know, Jeremiah, you know about the suffering servant. You know about Isaiah 53, by his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. You know all these things, but you won't believe them. Because you were so focused on, I expect God to do what I want, even though I have all this revelation, I'm going to dismiss the revelation and go with my feelings about what I want God to do. If you're in that position, you're in a dangerous position. Our actions and our beliefs must be based on revelation that God has given us in this book. And I want to be clear about this too. There is no other book of revelation other than this one that's from God. There may be a lot of other books out there 
They're not from heaven. They may be from a God with a small g, a demonic God, but they're not from the God of this Bible. They're not from Jehovah. All this stuff about, well, my books and this books and your book's just another book. No, it is not just another book. There is unlimited wisdom and there's life in this book. All other religious books lead to death. I don't care what religion, what book it is. If it's not in this book, it is not from God. This is the only revelation we have from God. So he said, did not Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Verse 27. And then, oh my goodness, don't you wish they would have recorded this message? I have looked at this over the years. And it says, and Jesus began with Moses and all of the prophets, and he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Why does it record it? <laughs> Do you not think that has to be the greatest message ever given by anybody in the history of the world, the greatest sermon, and it doesn't record it. Now, when we to heaven, one of my things as a younger man and even as an older man, I'm like, what would you say? I want to hear it all of it. I want to see it all in one big picture by you. I, my brain can't really understand all of this, but if you'll give it to me in one big lump sum, all in a row, starting with Moses and that, starting from Moses and all the prophets meant like the entire Old Testament and all the prophets. It was like, from Moses and all the prophets, the complete picture was given. Like we might say from A to Z. Here's when it says, when it was from Moses and all the prophets, he gave us A to Z, everything that was there. So beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if they were going to go further. I think this is important too. I looked at this and I was wondering, I wonder what, there's, they, they, get, they go seven miles, they stop, they're getting near Emmaus, and Jesus keeps walking along. And I thought about that, that maybe... As you heard me at the beginning of the thing, pray about, Lord, come with us and be with us. He, he, I want him to know our hearts, both in our hearts as well as in our mouths, that, Lord Jesus, please stay with us. I, I, don't want, I, I, I love the passage in the Old Testament where Moses was leading them, and they said, if God's not with us, I'm not going. I'm not going to go out and, and fight, or I'm not going to go into the promised land, or I'm not going to go against the enemy unless God is with us. If God's not with us, we can do nothing. And so Jesus was about to go on, and I think he was trying to raise them again to see if they still didn't know who he was. They were still kind of blinded uh, spiritually by who he was. Uh, divinely, maybe is a better word than spiritually. They were divinely blinded still. They didn't know who he was. So he was going to continue on, and they urged him strongly, and they said, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So now, as I said earlier, it was late in the day. He said he was going to rise the third day. We've been waiting. It's all day. The women came and told us. We got all these... All this information we've been trying to figure out what's going on, what's happening, how is what Jesus did not lining up with what we expect him to do? And I th thought about that. That's kind of us today too, huh? I expected Jesus to do this, but he didn't. He's doing this. Well, why is he doing that? He needs to be over here doing this stuff. And uh, we find out that he doesn't always do the things we expect him to do, but aren't you glad he always does what's the right thing for us? I am glad. When, that, when Peter said, when Jesus said, I'm going to the cross, and Peter said, don't do it, no, don't do it, I'm so glad Jesus said, I'm going to do what the Father has told me to do. Because he had not gone to the cross, we would not be here today. And we would be hopeless. Had he not come back from the grave, when he said, I'm going to rise up, had he, if we still saw the grave of Jesus, we knew where his bones were. <coughs> Hebrews, we mentioned a few weeks ago, what would the point of us being here? If we say we, we live whatever life God gives us here on this earth, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, whatever life we have or less, Whatever life we have, and when we die, we die, and there's nothing after. Why would we be here on Sunday mornings? There'd be no reason to give tithes and offerings. There'd be no reason to help someone. It'd be everything's about me. And that's the heartache I have is the world, they, that's what they believe. They believe there's nothing else after this life. We, we have to be salt and light and tell them there's so much more. This is, man's life is but a vapor, just a mist that comes up and disappears. There's eternity stretched out before us. We need to be living our lives here in this little window of vapor called physical life and planning and thinking about there's a spiritual eternity coming after this. And, and, I, and that spiritual eternity, yes, I'm going to heaven. Yes, I'm going to have Jesus my Savior. But is, am I going to be up there with crowns to give back to Jesus and rewards? Am I building up rewards and treasures in heaven? Or am I down here on earth just saying it's about me and I'm just kind of coasting along? And I like being on the road with the Lord. I like the messages from the Lord, but I don't really want to do much more with them than that. When we look at this, this growth of their struggling with the message, Jesus joins them. He raises their theology. He, eventually, now we're going to get to what he, they realize who he is. 
I told you four times in the scriptures this word homilego, this communion of being together, not only in their words, but in their minds, they were brought together. In three of the four times that this word is used, there's a breaking of bread and a realization of who Jesus is. And we see that now. It says, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on, going, acting as though he was going to go a little bit further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for the, it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he began to give it to them. Then I love verse 31. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus. Lord, if there's anything that I ask, let my eyes be opened that every time I recognize Jesus in every event, every situation, that Jesus is in it. And he's in it with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. He's with us. Whatever happens, we don't have to worry. Was well, God off busy doing something else? Is he not doing, paying attention? Is he not in charge of this? Yes, he is, and he's right there with us. The lack is our, our vision. The lack is in our divine or our spiritual vision is blinded sometimes. Even though we know who he is, even though we believe these words, we get blinded by the cares and the concerns of this world. So it says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus, and instantly he disappeared from their sight. Now, did he, is he still there with them? I want to be clear. It says he disappeared from their sight. It doesn't say he's no longer with them. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Like me, I suspect many of you, your highlight of your week is Sunday morning church. Maybe not when you first get up Sunday morning. Maybe not when the pollen's high. You know, you wake up, you're getting ready, you get the coffee, your eyes are burning, you're like, oh, it's Sunday but it seems like when we get here, though, when we start talking and hugging one another, I love, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. Faye, do you know David before two or three weeks ago? Da David, a new brother in Christ, our brother right here, David Martin. Make sure you get to meet him. Uh, I love sitting there, and I saw Faye come and say, hey, brother, how are you? And reached over and gave him a, a hug, and I thought, three weeks ago, they didn't even know each other. You, 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 two completely different people brought together in love because of what Christ has done. I just love to see that. And when she did, I was like, oh, she must know him. You can't be, you, but that, uh, that's Faye. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so I should caveat with that. That's Jesus. Faye wears Jesus on her shoulders and on her heart. But I just love seeing that. Just here's this brand new brother in Christ. And Faye, just good, it's good to see. Not just, hey, how you doing? You know, good seeing you. But hugs them, gave him a hug. And I just love that. And uh, th that kind of what brings us together. So it says, immediately he left from their sight. They asked one. And, and on Sunday morning, sometimes that's with us. I, I so often hear when the praise team is up here and the praise band and they're singing and I look around, I see people, you can see sometimes tears coming down and smiling and hands holding up and, and our hearts burn within us. We hear these words. We know that Jesus is here with us and sometimes our hearts burn within us. Just, I'm so glad to be here. Th thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you for another Sunday that I come together with family. And I can turn down the volume of the world for a little bit. And I can turn down the volume of all the headaches that are out there and the pains and the aches and pains of people's lives. And I can come in here and worship Amen. the risen Savior. So they're saying, they said, when he was with us, our hearts were burning. We were on fire when he was with us. We felt it inside of us. And he said that our hearts were burning within us while, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture. That on the road... That's another thing that's used often. We're on a tr lifetime journey with the Lord. Amen. We're on the road with the Lord from the moment you accept Christ until he returns or calls us home, as we sang in the song a moment ago. One of those is going to happen. He's going to call you home or he's going to return. And from the day you accept him till that day comes, we are on the road with Jesus. Amen. He's with us on the road, teaching us, tr telling us. Deuteronomy, uh, back even in the Old Testament, um, I've got my wrong notes here. doesn't matter. You remember the passage of the great Sheman, Deuteronomy 6, though, where it says, Teach your children, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Teach your children while you're walking in the way, while you rise up, while you lay down. When you're with others, speak of the Lord. Speak of the holy words. We're, we're commanded that in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy. Here is the same thing. Jesus with them on the way, talking of these things, these holy things. That needs to be our, our kind of attitude and our Focus. Yes, we got to pay bills, and yes, we have to go to work, and yes, we have to fix a flat tire. Is that someone's car out there from one of us with a flat tire out there? Yes, we've got to do all those things that come up, but our focus really needs to be on the holy things of the Lord. 
Now, what time of day was this approximately? It said it was late in the day. I think it was probably 4 to 7 o'clock at night in the afternoon. They said it's been the third day. Uh, stay with us. It's late in the day. We just walked home seven miles. It's late in the day. Stay with us. But when they realized who he was and they knew their hearts were burning within them, verse 33, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. How far away is Jerusalem? So they made a 14-mile trip. They, they came home seven miles. And they, hey, it's late. It's going to be tired. It's just seven miles. We came home. There was no buckies on the road to Emmaus. It was, we had to just go all the way there by ourselves and maybe brought a little flask of water or something. And it's late in the day, so stay with us and, and get some bread and some, uh, something to eat, some sustenance, have dinner with us. And Jesus goes in and broke the bread and their eyes were open. And it's late in the day. But once they got that message, once they realized that burning message within us, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. On the way home without Jesus, remember he said, what are you talking about? Why are you so sad? Why is your countenance fallen? Oh, Jesus is gone, and what our hope was wasn't there. But when they got their theology, when they got their understanding raised, do you think they walked back to Jerusalem like that? Uh, Jesus came back from the grave. We saw him. Let's go back to Jerusalem and tell everybody. I suspect if there was timed races back then, they may have won a seven-mile race hands down. I got a feeling they were excited. And that should be us. Once we understand who Jesus truly is, and he's given this message of these things, that the Son of Man would be betrayed, handed over to sinful men, given up by the rulers of Israel, given up by our sin. He went to a cross and died, and he was buried, and he rose again, and he's coming back. When we have that message, that should make our hearts burn within us and desire and be aggressive in telling people that. Be excited about it. It says, they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, saying, it is true. What happened back in verse 11? The women told them and they didn't believe. But now we see a completely different scenario. They didn't believe. Now they not only believe it, they're proclaiming it. Back in verse 11, I didn't believe it. Now they believe it. Hey, it's true. What, the, what Mary has said is true. What Mary Magdalene said is true. We saw it. We know for a fact it is true, the Lord has risen, and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two uh, told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized uh, by them when he broke the bread. And, and I love that the breaking of the bread is brought up here again. It was mentioned back in verse 30. He broke the bread. They mentioned again, we recognize him in the breaking of the bread. When we took communion last Sunday morning, Easter morning, remember we said we do this in remembrance of you. As off as you do this, remember me. Bring to your mind who the Lord, the risen Lord is. You might see my tie. It says, he is risen. I know it's not Easter, and I said, I'm going to wear it anyway. Because I'm going to proclaim he is risen. Not just on Easter Sunday, every day. Everyone we meet, he's risen. What are you talking about? Jesus is risen from the grave. Yeah, I know. Then why aren't you excited? If you knew, like I knew, you would be excited about it. I told you last week, it, it still has pained me. An individual told me, well, I'm a... Christian, just like you, but I don't like to mention Jesus' name because it's offensive. Well, number one, you're not a Christian like me. That, yeah, let's get that straight right there. You're not a Christian like me because I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed to declare the name of Jesus because I don't want him to be ashamed to declare my name to the Father. Oh, you believe that? Okay, you're not a Christian like me. <laughs> yes, I believe that. It is true. I can't make you believe, but I pray and I wish to God that you do because the results of disbelief are eternity in hell. Hell is hot. God is real. Jesus is the way. Do you believe or not? Amen. It's pretty simple. Well, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. He died for my sins. He was buried. He rose again. He's coming back. Are you prepared? No, I'm not. Well, do you want to be? Yes, I do. What must I do to be saved? The Philippian jailer in Acts 16, 31. What must I do to be saved? Paul answered back, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's very simple. And we should be bold and excited. And after you walk 14 miles, be happy to tell someone. I, I talked to my dad the other day. Some of you know he had a stroke and he's down. And he, he said, you know, everything's gone. We're selling my house and, you, you know, things are going different. And I don't drive anymore, and I can't even walk hardly anymore. We're putting in a, a chairlift and in the house. I can't get upstairs. And, and he said, that, what I miss the most? My jail ministry. 
talking to the guys in there about Jesus Christ and what he's done for me and what he's willing to do for them. I said, Dad, that is very, I know you're my, bi my biological father, but you're also very much of a spiritual father to me. Because when I hear a man talk like that with heart failure, stroke, blind in an eye, stealing his neck, missing a finger, stealing his knees, walking down a hall, I've seen him in jails before walking down the hall, holding on the wall, just pouring sweat. Dad, quit. Slow down. Let someone else know. I'll die telling people Jesus loves them. The last words out of my mouth want to be, Jesus loves you. That's what, that's what drives me. I said, Dad, you are driven. There is no question about it. And all that's going on, I said, the thing I miss the most is my jail ministry. Going and talking to those guys. That should be every one of us. Every one of us. Hey, my PTA meeting, my uh, sewing needles, knitting club, my library time at the grocery store, at the uh, Chick-fil-A, wherever I, you know, of course at Chick-fil-A, but at Whataburger or Burger King or, <laughs> you know, wherever, wherever I am, <laughs> wherever I am, I'm, I want to tell people, God bless you. God has blessed me. Brother, sister, or friend, has God blessed you? What are you talking about? I'm, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you what he's, how he's blessed me. He's blessed me with eternal life. Do you want to live eternally? Yes, I do. Who's going to say no to that? You might have all these other, all you got to do is lay the message out there. It's not, you can't save them. You can tell them the message. How will they hear unless someone tells them? How will they worship the one? How will they accept Jesus if they don't hear his name? How will they know his name if someone doesn't tell them his name? We plant, we water, God brings the increase. You tell people, here's who Jesus is for me. Here's who he is for you. Here's what he's willing to do. Here's what he's done for you already. It is finished. It's done. All you got to do is accept. I reject that. I don't believe it. Okay. I'll pray for you. I'm done. You can't make them saved. You can't talk. I, I, don't you wish you could talk people into salvation? I'll just use enough words and have enough ideas, and I'll just wear them down till they find. I'll be a used car salesman. I'll just wear them down till they finally give up. Maybe that's what we need to start doing. I don't know. I say it sarcastically. Then I thought maybe if that'll work, just wear them down. But just keep preaching the message and be excited about it. I'm going to close our day. We'll pick up next week. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and, uh, Chris, excellent. Chris said, let's go ahead and pray real quick. I'm going to pray for the lady that's an uh, atheist. We're going to pray that the Lord opens her heart and makes her softer to God. And then also, if you have any prayer requests, uh, please do fill out those yellow or white cards that are there in the uh, chair by you. We'll be happy and delighted and honored to pray for you and for your prayer requests. You can be as open as you want or is, is just, you don't even got to put your name. You just say uh, pr private prayer requests, you know, I need prayer. Don't, you don't even got to put your name. God knows exactly who you are. We'll hold that up and pray for it. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this message and what an awesome God you are. Father, we thank you so much for having your son, Jesus Christ, right here in our midst as we spoke these things, these words that you've given us today. Father, we lift up this lady and many others that have rejected your son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to send someone, send your spirit, soften their hearts, make their hearts receptive to the seed that's planted and that uh, someone else would water and grow and that you would bring the increase in their life and they would come into the family of God. Father, we lift up this young girl, the, the daughter of this lady, that we don't know her future, but we know that you do. Father, may, I have no idea, Father, maybe someone in this, this congregation might, might, if there's an adoption possibility, maybe we could, someone would be willing to adopt this young girl if that's a need that comes up. Father, we don't know your will, but Father, we're excited to know that you are working on our behalf and all good things come from you. Father, we lift up this service. We lift up as we go out into your fields. They're white unto harvest. Father, we pray that you would send forth laborers into your fields. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.